evening's title message, God's Calendar, Christ and the Feasts of Israel. It's important that you understand, we're going to try and understand how the plan of God of salvation for the world was prescribed, has already been determined, has already been formed 25, 2600 years ago. In fact, almost, excuse me, 3500 years ago. In Isaiah, and I always love to start the messages, Isaiah 46, because I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God loves to declare his plans. Sometimes he declares them in real writing and sometimes he's hiding them, not hiding them, but he's, he's actually showing you that in the past there was something but in the future that something reflected something else and that's the beauty of the word of god the old is 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 actually um revealed in the new and the new is concealed in the old and both are going together and every time jesus said that all those things that are written must take place Jesus speaks of the Old Testament. All those things that were written by the prophets must take place. And unfortunately, instead of going to the things that are written, to the things that we are instructed to learn and study, people love to go to those places that are not written, the places that are nicer and cooler probably, that makes a bit more interest in our Christian boring walk probably. And then they come up with some strange theories and theologies. Lately, I, you know, I was attacked by blood moons and Shemitah and so many, you know, uh, different things. And, you know, it's already October and we're still here. And I say that if there are some things that God wants us not to know, then we should not know. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belongs to the Lord our God, but those things that are revealed belongs to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Which means that we have to remember that there are things not for us to deal with and the things that He wants us to deal with are the things in His written, given word to all of us. Amen? Now, now comes the beauty of how the old and the new are walking together. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we see how Paul is writing to the people of Colossia and he's basically telling them something very interesting. He's telling them, therefore, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. And there is a tendency in the Christian world to always go to the shadow rather to the substance, to always try to keep that which God tells us. It's not the real thing. You know, when you walk, look at the shadow that I'm casting right here. Normal people cast the shadow first and then they come later on. If you walk in the streets and you don't cast the shadow in the daylight, then go to see a doctor. But you need to understand, casting a shadow is a normal thing as you're in the day. And it actually, when you see the shadow, and the shadow sometimes can be big and impressive and huge. But the shadow tells you that the substance is about to come. The shadow tells you that someone is about to come. The real thing is about to come. Now, sometimes it's a small little person that casts a very big shadow. Sometimes it's the opposite, but it doesn't matter. Still, the shadow is just the image on the floor, and it is not going to talk to you. It is not going to respond to you. It is not going to shake your hand. It is not going to listen to you. It is just a shadow. And it is there to tell you that the real thing is about to come. 
And so, therefore, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is, of course, of Christ. So it's interesting, you know, the Lord God of Israel is taking the people of Israel out of the house of bondage, out of the house of slavery, and he's leading them now through the desert. And from the moment, the moment he's about to take them out, he tells them, listen to me, start writing down a calendar. Because the act of the Exodus will be the first month of your calendar. And from now on, everything I'm going to do with you while I'm taking you out from Egypt will become a symbol that will be celebrated every year by you. So as you are preparing, jot down and get ready because our journey will be also journaled. It is going to be an interesting thing. It's the calendar of God that he is now prescribing and it is taking all of us in a wonderful journey through seven festivals, all described in Leviticus chapter 23. What are those seven festivals? It's the Passover. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's the Feast of First Fruits. It's the Feast of Weeks which you call Pentecost, Pentecost, going to 50, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. These are the seven festivals that the Lord prescribed for the children of Israel to celebrate once a year. And that's apart from the Sabbath that they were supposed to celebrate every, every week. And so... I decided to take all these seven and break them down to the shadow and the substance and show you Christ from the very beginning to the very end. And let's see what he's going to lead us to. You know, the Passover takes us all the way to Exodus 12 when there is that description of what that lamb should be. Your lamb should be without blemish. The whole assembly of Israel shall kill it. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts. Isn't that interesting? The children of Israel, when they were in Egypt, were instructed by the Lord to take a year old, beautiful, cute little lamb and to house it, to put it in their house for four days and pet it and feed it and be very nice to it. Now, I know some of you here have goats in their house, or at least outside the house. Well, some of you may have sheep. I'm not sure, but I don't know one thing. You fall in love with those little creatures, especially when they're little and small you know, and cute. And, and after four days, they were supposed to kill the animal. Watch this. Kill the animal. The animal that did nothing. Nothing wrong. And take a branch of hyssop, dip it in the blood and sprinkle the blood on the two doorposts of their house. Wow. Now, interestingly enough, we know that the angel came down from the Lord. The angel came down to Egypt. And what was the instruction that God gave to the angel? Wherever you see blood pass over that house, And don't kill the firstborn of that house. In other words, the only criteria, it wasn't wherever you see a Jew, wherever you see an Israelite, wherever you see a handsome person, wherever. No, it was all about wherever you see the blood sprinkled on the two doorposts. In other words, if the Egyptians would have heard that which they need to do, if the Egyptians would have applied the blood on the two doorposts of their homes, they would be escaping that judgment. Because the eyes of God, even in the Ark of the Covenant, the eyes of the two cherubims are always on that seat of mercy where the blood was sprinkled. The eyes of God through the blood of an innocent lamb 
could really free you from the judgment and from death. Whether you are an Egyptian or an Israelite. And it's interesting because when we look at John chapter 1 verse 29... Remember, it has to be an unblemished, a year old. Look, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. You know, he could have said, Behold, the Lion of Judah. He could have said so many things. But he saw in Jesus that which every Jew could have in his mind just when Passover arrived. By the way, that's why Paul called Jesus our Passover. Look, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. It is the blood of Christ on the doorposts of your hearts that will have judgment skip you and not fall on your on, on you and therefore you will not die you understand that it's very simple see that which was given to the people of Israel 3500 years ago applies to all of you today it's the blood that causes the judgment to pass over Hmm. And so, right after they killed that Lamb of God, and they started going out of Egypt in the desert, before they started the journey, you need some food. Now, there was no time for a good New York style bagels. There was no time to put yeast and wait for the dough to rise and then bake nice bread. All they had is flour and water. They had to mix it together and put it on the oven. And they had to just literally uh, 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 pierce that dough so it won't rise. And that piercing. And then when you put it and you pierce it all around, you see stripes and you see piercing. That's what the unleavened bread looks like, the matzah bread. And it says on that 15th day of the same month in that feast of unleavened bread to the Lord, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Interesting. Seven days. Seven days shows you the length that you need to understand that that bread has no leaven. You should inspect it. You should see that it's long enough to determine there is definitely no leaven in it. And that brings me to 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven. Leaven in typology is a symbol of sin. And that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. When we are being forgiven of our sins, we become unleavened. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, it says, Therefore, let us keep the feast Not with old leaven, not with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Interesting how Passover is Jesus being killed and the blood applied, but the unleavened bread speaks of the sinless life of Jesus. And Jesus was here not for a week Not for 10 days, but for three years, there was enough time for every person to see that he is indeed sinless. Even Pilate himself knew that Jesus did nothing wrong. And so, Jesus is not only the Passover, but he's definitely the unleavened bread. That's why he said when he took the bread, he broke it and said, take it. This is my body broken for you. Speaking of the unleavened bread as a symbol, not as if his own body himself. We're not eating the body of Christ here at least. And then, in a very interesting manner in Leviticus 23, it says, Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruit to your harvest to the priest. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Isn't that interesting? The day after the Sabbath. So if Passover took place on Tuesday, you wait until the Sabbath comes, and on Sunday, you bring that sheaf. 
If Passover took place on Friday, then you wait the Sabbath, and on Sunday, it was always be Sunday, the day after the Sabbath. Interesting. The day after the Sabbath, they don't even call it Sunday. You know, in Hebrew, we don't call it Sunday. It's pagan name, Sunday, the day of the sun, Monday, the day of the moon. We call it first day, second day, third day, fourth day. The only day that has no fourth, fifth, sixth is Shabbat, the Sabbath, because it means cease from working. But the day after the Sabbath is always the first day of the week, Sunday. And it's interesting how in Matthew 28, now after the Sabbath, look, the New Testament uses the same exact lingo. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, the angel said, as they came to the tomb, he is not here. He has risen as he said. And that's why the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead. He has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus was the first fruits. And his resurrection had to be on what day of the week? The first day after the Sabbath. And how do you call it? Sunday. Wow. So it's okay to celebrate the day of the Lord on Sunday. And it's interesting because you can see how Jesus is fulfilling everything from being the Passover lamb, being the sinless person, all the way to being offered and then resurrect as the first fruit on the day after the Sabbath. And then, of course, comes the Feast of Weeks. The Bible says in Leviticus 23, you shall count for yourself from the day after the Sabbath, from that day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. You, you, you have to understand something. People talk about blood moons, tetrads, blah, blah, blah. When the Bible wants you to start counting something, the Bible tells you to count something. When the Bible wants you to look into a specific phenomena or specific time period that you must the Bible tells you that. And so you have to count seven Sabbaths. So one, two, three, four. How many days? Seven times seven. Forty-nine. And then he says, count 50 days, which means on the 50th day, you shall proclaim on the same day that it is a holy convocation to you. Wow. You know, the Jewish tradition is that it took 50 days for the children of Israel to walk all the way from Egypt to Mount Sinai. And they believe that when the Lord brought the law to the people of Israel, they, by the way, it's written in the Jewish Talmud, not only that the law came, but also tongues of fire came with it. It's written all over the Jewish uh, Talmud. So it's interesting because the Jews believe that the law was given on that festival 50 days after the first day of the week of the first fruits. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, and as good Jews... By the way, I want to remind you, Jesus was a Jew. Now, I'm not saying that for nothing. Seven days ago... In Washington, D.C., Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who is the pastor of President Obama, he stood up there in front of many Muslim Americans and said that Jesus was a Palestinian. I'm not kidding you. He said Jesus was a Palestinian. Namely, he was an Arab. Now, excuse me, but that's not what my Bible says. My Bible says, not only he was a Jew, but everything that God prescribed to the Jewish people, he himself fulfilled. And so, in Acts chapter 2, as they came together in one accord, and it's not a commercial for Honda here. And then in one place, suddenly there came sound from heaven. And of course, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, that day that the Jews 
are celebrating the coming down of the law. On that day, God brought down what? The Holy Spirit. Make no mistake. You're enjoying something that none of the Jews in the history enjoyed before. You are all hopefully having the Holy Spirit in you. I hope. Because if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you're not going to see Christ. You know, you're going to see him coming and going. (laughs) You're those uh, virgins that don't have oil in their lamps. And so in the Old Testament, the the Holy Spirit never filled someone and he was never sealed with it. The Bible says that in the Old Testament, the, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the Holy Spirit could leave you. This is why David the king begged the Lord in Psalm 51 once Nathan came and Nathan um, was basically um, telling him, you're a sinner. (laughs) You look what you did with Bathsheba. And David said, yes, I am a sinner. And he's praying to God and says, please take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because he knew it's an option. And it's interesting because now for the first time, the Holy Spirit is descending corporately and you are sealed with it. You know what it means, seal? Nobody can open it. Nobody's allowed to open it. Sealed. And it's interesting because why do you think the people of the tribe of Levi, the Levites, were set apart. How come God chose Levi and not Menashe or Judah? It's because when the children of Israel, when they were impatient until Moses will come down from Mount Sinai and they started building that golden calf, the only tribe that did not take part in that horrific pagan ceremony was the tribe of Levi. And that's why God set them apart. You know, God honored that. And the Bible says in Exodus 32, So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. But then the judgment that came upon the people of Israel because of the golden calf, because of that law that came, about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. And isn't that interesting the parallel, and in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, then those who gladly received His word were baptized, and that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. See, the Bible says that this, the law killeth, the Spirit gives life. Amen? So you see, there is a great parallel between that which was written and that which has come later in order to fulfill, in order to be the substance. Don't go back to the shadow. Continue to focus on the substance. And now comes the interesting thing. You see, Jesus fulfilled Passover and the unleavened bread, the first fruit, and of course, the Holy Spirit came and Pentecost was fulfilled. These are the spring holidays. Now comes a long period and the fall holidays are coming. That's the time that had to pass from the time of Jesus to our time today. Now comes the exciting things. Are you ready? Now comes the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is the most bizarre and weird festival on the Jewish calendar. Come, blow the trumpets and go home. He says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing the trumpets, a holy convocation. Well, well, blowing the trumpets, holy convocation? What for? Why do people blow trumpets for? What for? What is it all about? And that throws me back to trumpets in Numbers chapter 10. Moses was given an instruction by the Lord. Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the assembly 
and for directing the movement of the camp. Which means, get ready. Calling the assembly. Get ready. Get ready to move. Get ready to fight. Get ready for something or for someone. That's what it was all about. And so, now we understand what trumpets are all about. But why two and why silver? Two, let's go, why, why silver? Silver is precious metal, but it's not perfect. It's not gold. Trumpets, we already understand. It's to warn. Why two? Hmm. Very interesting. It takes me all the way back to Matthew 24. Jesus said to the disciples who asked him about the signs of the end times, learn this parable from the fig tree. He spoke about world events and global catastrophes and he stopped right in the middle and he says, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. You understand? Jesus says, I'm, I'm telling you, learn the parable from the fig tree. It's a parable. I'm not talking about the fig tree. The fig tree resembles something. And I, I immediately went back to study about the fig tree. And I found in Joel chapter 1, For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the lion teeth. And he has the fangs of fierce lion. And he has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. Israel is God's fig tree. In Hosea 9.10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits of the fig tree in its season. So you see, in Ezekiel, when he speaks of the rebirth of Israel, it is exactly what is Jesus prophesied about the fig tree coming back to life. For I will take you from among the nations. I will gather you out of all the countries. And I will bring you into your own land. It's interesting. That pastor said to the crowd. He said not only that Jesus was a Palestinian. He said the land. The original owners of the land. Are the Palestinians. Well I don't know what Bible he's reading. But I know that my Bible says. That God says, I will take them from among the nations. I will gather them out of the countries. And I will bring them into their own land. You understand? It's very simple. He did it. You have a problem with it? Talk to him. I did not bring my grandparents from the Holocaust. God made them survive. God brought them all the way. No country helped us coming all the way back to the land of Israel. No country helped us. Having to deal with nuclear threats. We had to go and destroy the Iraqi nuclear reactor ourselves. And the Americans condemned us for it. And imposed sanctions on us in 1981. We had to take care of business in 2007. And destroy the Syrian nuclear reactor. No country came to help us. They told us you're all by yourself. Now everybody is thanking us. That ISIS in Iraq and in Syria. Is not having nuclear weapons in their hands. But you see. The rebirth of Israel was prophesied already, not only by Ezekiel, but even by Jesus himself. And now comes the point why I believe it's two trumpets. You see, according to Isaiah 43 verse 10, Israel is the witness of God. You are my witnesses, he says in Isaiah chapter 43. You are my witnesses, says the Lord to the people of Israel. Interesting. They are his witnesses. No wonder why when Queen Victoria asked her special closest advisor, give me one proof that there is a God. And he told her, I'll give you one proof in one word, Israel. If they are still here, there has to be a God. Israel is God's witness. And this is why the enemy wants to destroy us. Because the enemy always wants to destroy the evidence and kill the witness. Same goes with the church. The church was born in the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, what does it say? It says the following thing. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. I'll read it from here then. Okay, no problem. You can clearly see. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be what? Witnesses. 
You see, Israel is God's witness, and the church is God's witness, and there's only two and only witnesses of God in this world, and it's the church and Israel, and this is why we will always suffer together, not just enjoy things together. Whoever wants to destroy Israel is normally anti-Christian, trust me. It goes together. And so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, and at the last, what? You see, guys, trumpet is related to a specific event. Here it says that our rapture is going to happen when? At the last trumpet. You see, I believe that ever since 1948, when Israel was born once again into its land, God is using Israel and the church for the first time together as the trumpets that are telling the world that get ready, something is going to happen, someone is about to come. And it's interesting because at the last trumpet, we're out of here. I didn't say that. The Bible said that. So the rapture is related to the trumpets and related to the Feast of Trumpets. And I believe that the Feast of Trumpets is not a specific single day for us. It is a series of events, a series of blowing of the trumpets. And when the last trumpet is going to blow, we are out of here. Amen. So, we live in those days right now. Israel is all alone. For the first time since Israel was born, it's completely isolated. Russia is not with us, is against us. Europe is not with us, is against us. America, the administration at least, is not with us, is against us. No one is beside us. No one. And it had been prophesied. It had been predicted. It is for God to get all the glory. Amen? And then comes the sixth and the most tragic one, the Day of Atonement. The Bible says in Leviticus 23, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month shall be a day of atonement. You shall afflict your souls. What is to afflict your soul? is to really understand that you are helpless. You can't do anything. You can't save yourself. See, the Jewish people translate it to fasting. Well, the Bible wants to tell you that you should fast. The Bible tells you fast. But we don't hear fasting here. It's afflicting your souls. Interestingly enough, Zechariah tells us that the day is going to come when Jesus will come back and they will look on me whom they pierced. Yea, yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns. For his only son. When the Jewish people will see Christ Jesus returning in the clouds, coming with his feet, standing on Mount of Olives, riding on his right horse with us coming with him. Amen. Hello. Then those who are the remnant of the great tribulation, the last third, according to Zechariah 13, they will look upon him and they will mourn. And they will cry and they will repent and they will be saved. And that's what Romans 11 says. And all Israel will be saved. And then, of course, tabernacles. The 15th day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. The longest and the happiest festivals in Israel's calendar. We just celebrated it. Zechariah 14 says that even in the end times, all of us will continue celebrating it. And it should come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Isn't that great? All of us are going to go because the Lord will tabernacle with His people. The Lord tabernacles. The Lord is dwelling inhabits the praises of his people. So, the seven festivals, were they fulfilled? First fruit, excuse me, the Passover, of course, speaks of the crucifixion of the Lord. Unleavened bread speaks of the sinless life of the Lord, past. We know that weeks, Pentecost, the descending of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church, 
it's already passed. We know that trumpets, I believe, since 1948, Israel and the church exist, and we are the trumpets. It is now. The Day of Atonement is the second coming of Christ, Israel's national salvation. It is in the future. And of course, the Feast of Tabernacles speaks of the millennial kingdom when the Lord will tabernacle with His people. And that, of course, is the future. What is missing? What's missing is the rapture's exact time. You see, I told you everything, but we didn't talk about the exact time of the rapture. Why? Because... We should not know the day or the hour. But we know one thing. It is what? Very soon. Very, very soon. You have to understand something. God in the festivals of Israel prescribed His plan of redemption to the whole world. Not only for Israel. Israel was just a way for Him to communicate His word for the whole world. And He is now putting His blueprint of salvation to the whole world. Everyone who confessed that Jesus is Lord, that He died for your sins, that He was buried and resurrected, everyone who believes will be saved. Amen? That's as far as the gospel is concerned. So the plan of God, the plan of redemption is there. And then there is this satanic plan of deception to tell you that all you need to be is a good person. You need to do good things. You will enter the kingdom of God no matter what. You were here when I taught about that regarding the rise of the one world religion. The only thing that separates you from God's plan is a choice. It's a free choice. It is within your hand to decide whether you are adopting the godly plan of redemption Or you are falling into the satanic plan of deception. The Bible says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish. It's all full of unrighteousness and deception. Because, and what happened is, those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. That they might be saved. You see, you do not receive the love of the truth. Then you'll perish. But that's your choice. You choose not to. And then, of course, this reason God will send them strong delusion. That they should believe the lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe in the truth. But had pleasure in the unrighteousness. What gives you pleasure in this world? Loving God, serving God. Or being in the world, going out, drinking, and partying, and dancing. What really excites you in this world? Is it the world, or is it serving God? Is it your business, or is it the Father's business? What really is the motivation of your life nowadays, as we reach the last hour of the last days? Because I tell you something, the victory has already been determined. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, and 8, for the mystery, the Bible says, for the mystery of lawlessness, yes, it's already at work, but only he who now restrains the Holy Spirit will do so until he's taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Jesus will return and he will destroy all that the enemy is about to prepare. So the victory has already been achieved. Jesus is already on the winning side. We know the end from the beginning. Now the choice is ours to be with the victory, victorious side or to be with the losers. To enjoy the pleasures of the world now that are so temporary or to be on our knees knowing that this is the last hour. This is the time to share. This is the time to pray. This is the time to love and care. This is it. We must, until He comes, be in our Father's business. We must occupy. We must dominate. We must not be passive. The Bible says, what kind of a trumpet are you? In 1 Corinthians 14, 8. Remember, we're trumpets. It says, for if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for a battle? You see, 
You're all trumpets. We are trumpets. We are living in the days of the feast of trumpets. And the last trumpet, he's going to come and take us. But if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who is going to prepare? You see, once we reach eternity, there's no way back. You cannot really fix things. You know, remember what Jesus talks about in his amazing parable, talking about Lazarus, remember? The poor man and the king. You can't fix things. That's it. So if you want to make things right, this is your time now, not later on. And it's important that we do that because this is it. And I want to conclude the message with something that C.S. Lewis wrote in one of his books. It's one of my favorite Christian authors. And he wrote something very profound. C.S. Lewis, I don't know if we can show it on the screen, um, but um, he wrote something very profound. He basically said, when we, as we come to the end, there will be those people who will say to God, Thy will be done. And then, those whom God says to, in the end, thy will be done. You understand? If you choose to reject God, God says, okay, then your will be done. But it's your will. <laughs> it's your choice. And then he says, all that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy, the joy of our salvation, will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. And those who knock, it will be open. So this evening, as we come to an end, and we can prepare for the end, I want to challenge you this evening. You see, what is going on in the world is alarming for the non-believer. What is going on in the world should scare the one who is not prepared. What is going on in the world will only intensify, as Jesus said. What is going on in the world will definitely is going to increase more earthquakes, more famines, more pestilences, more nature disasters, more wars, more rumors of wars, more nations against nations, and more kingdoms against kingdoms. And Jesus said it is just the beginning. Now we're not here to talk about romantic events. We're here to talk about what the world is going through right now. And the question is, where's your heart this evening? Are you ready? Are you ready to meet your creator? Do you understand that Jesus is looking at you? And there is two things that he can say. Well done, good and faithful servant. Or, I do not know you. <laughs> These are two things that Jesus can say and it's up to you what he is going to say because it's up to what you did and what you decided in the time that he gave you in this world. I cannot ever since things are going crazy, you know, in the last few years, I, there is not even a single message that I can finish without giving the people the opportunity to get right with the Lord. I'm telling you guys, you know, if I'm not going to let you repent, your blood is on my hand. Ezekiel says that in chapter 33. He says, I, can, I must tell you. Now what you do with it or not, that's your problem. But I must tell you. And the Bible says, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. So this evening... I'm extending an invitation. We've seen God's word is fulfilled. 
God is perfect. He's not late. He's not too early. He prescribed everything. Jesus came and fulfilled everything. God's is love. God wants you to be saved. God doesn't want you to choose hell. God says in the book of um, Deuteronomy chapter 30, he says, choose life. I put before you death and life. Choose life. 